Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to talk about gold versus silver, which is better. If you're interested in gold, uh, stock markets, and just learning how to make money in the current financial markets in the stock market, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So there's this old debate. We have gold bugs, we have silver bugs. I've been getting lots of questions from all of you, so I thought I'd do a quick lecture on gold versus silver. But in order to do that, we need to understand some of the functions of money, uh, both as a medium of exchange and as a store of value. So let's look at a couple previous forms of money and see what happened to them. And that'll give us a good idea what is currently happening to these uh, precious metals, silver and gold. So a lot of people know that Native Americans and also um, groups all over the world have used shells as money. This was fairly common uh, among the Iroquois and Algonquin. And um, this was fine until the Europeans came. But once the Europeans came, they quickly figured out that uh, you could, you could uh, go get a bunch of shells from somewhere else and then use them to buy up American real estate to trade with the Iroquois. And so what happened is the demonetization of shells as money. They no longer functioned just because there was such a huge supply of them that it crashed the price. Now, this is what uh, this is where we still get the uh, the term clams. How many clams will that cost me? It's a little bit old fashioned now, but that comes from the use of shell money. So one of the one of the great um, lessons of money is if you create too much of it, or if it's not scarce, if you can just print money, for example, like the Federal Reserve does now, it crashes the value of the money. It's no longer a good store of value. And if you had two groups, if you had one group in the uh, call it the 18th century or, or the 17th century that was storing their wealth in shells and another group that was storing their wealth in gold and silver coins, maybe Spanish coins or uh, uh, English coins, the group that stored their wealth in shells went bankrupt essentially. Their shells became virtually worthless. The group that stored their money in a hard currency uh, like gold or silver coins did very well. And this is one reason that the Europeans, among many other reasons, obviously uh, disease, guns, these sort of things, one reason Europeans were able to uh, really devastate the Native American tribes. So one of these lessons is don't store your wealth in a currency that can be debased, that you can just go get uh, either print a lot of it or go take your boat and load up on shells and dump it. Now, some, so this is called demonetization, when something no longer function as, functions as money. Now, when people think of demonetization, they often think of a government ruling saying this, that you can't use this for any money anymore. But what really, the, the more interesting version of it is where people just stop storing their wealth in something because the value crashes. So for example, if you store your wealth in apples, you will be bankrupt within a week or two after the apples rot. And so there's a sense in which hard money uh, confers, confers advantages over people who have uh, uh, soft money. Now, there have been many different kinds of metals used for coins. Uh, the earliest coins, I believe, were made out of iron. And Alexander the Great really popularized this as he moved from Greece all the way to India. And uh, iron coins, copper coins were also very common in uh, Greek times. This, this dates copper coins to the third century uh, BCE or third century before Christ. And um, one thing you need is you need a certain technological sophistication to extract the copper and make it into coins. I think iron was a little bit easier than copper but the problem with both of these metals is they're very, very common. And uh, as soon as people start making copper coins, if you can just discover a copper mine, you can make a whole bunch of them and crash the value. And that's one reason copper is not used in coins anymore. It used to be used in pennies, uh, but the US currency is being debased so much that uh, a, cop a penny worth of copper became worth much more than, um, than a penny. And so they had to switch to zinc etc. But metals, these are basically industrial metals, and they function based on supply and demand. And what happens if the price goes up a lot? If the price of copper goes up a lot, or the price of iron goes up a lot, or if the price of shells goes up a lot, what you do is you just make more of them. You go open up uh, shell mines or copper mines or uh, iron mines, 
And so when you see a chart of an industrial metal that functions more based on supply and demand, as opposed to a precious metal or monetary metal that's used for money, you can see copper is very mean reverting. When prices get high, they just, they just start mining more copper and it's, uh, they can get more for their uh, per ounce of copper. And so there's an incentive for mines to really crank up the supply and then this crashes, uh, this crashes the price. And this is what happened with shells, with seashells. This is what happened with uh, iron coins and what happened with copper coins. Now silver is uh, somewhat similar. If we look at a chart of silver, we can see that it's got similar spikes. We have the famous uh, Silver Tuesday here when the Hunt brothers tried to corner the silver supply in 1980 in the United States. They bought silver futures. They tried to buy up all the physical silver. And uh, then the government changed uh, the laws on them. The futures exchanges changed the margin requirements. And uh, as well as all the silver mines in the world, all of a sudden said, wow, we can get a lot for our silver. It had previously been trading under, uh, under $10, under $5 an ounce. All of a sudden it's close to $50 an ounce. But this is what happens with, this is how you can tell something is an industrial metal. It's not a, it's not a precious metal. And we got another spike, I believe it was 2000, uh, 2011, 2012. And when the price went up, it didn't go quite up. It went to about $45 a share, it looks. I mean, $45 an ounce. And what happened, the copper mines just, I'm sorry, the silver mines, we're looking at silver here priced in, uh, in US dollars. The silver mines just produced a whole bunch more and it crashed the price. So by this, we can tell that silver is no longer a precious metal or a monetary metal. It trades more like, it's slightly, uh, slightly better than copper. It looks like it's a little bit harder, harder to crash, uh, but it is very mean reverting. And it's become much more of a, a industrial metal than a monetary metal. So in order to understand how this happened, we're gonna take a brief, uh, a brief tour through the history of silver as money. Obviously it's been used since, uh, since antiquity as well. Uh, I believe the Greeks used silver coins and uh, the Egyptians may have as well. Certainly the Romans did. If we fast forward to the US founding of the constitution, there's a phrase in there that uh, says that the states can only use gold and silver for legal tender. In other words, as a medium of exchange or a store of value. In this case, it's official government money. But it's very interesting, obviously, it, earlier in US history, there was, the states had much more power than they do now. And this has been one of the problems as the US has evolved. Uh, so gold and silver are both listed as being able to be used as monetary metals, as coins. Uh, then we have the, a uh, few years later, we have the Coinage Act of 1792. This is when uh, the U.S. Mint was established and uh, the silver dollar was set up as the unit of money in the United, uh, the United States. And it was pegged, early on it was pegged to the Spanish silver dollar. Now at the same time they were making gold and silver coins. This is still the Coinage Act of 1792. You can see that we have uh, gold coins up here, eagles, half eagles, quarter eagles, and then we have dollars, which are all made out of silver. We have cents and half cents, which are made out of copper, as they were until the middle of the, uh, call it the middle of the 20th century. Now, uh, you can see the dollar is pegged to silver. So $1, one US dollar in 1792, was defined as 21.1 uh, grains of pure uh, of pure silver, an eagle, which was ten dollars, was sixteen point oh four grains of pure gold. I assume that means twenty four karat gold. It's interesting right now if we look up how much a gold grain is valued at. If we take that same amount, which was ten dollars back in seventeen ninety two, ten U S dollars, we plug it in this calculator. It tells us right now that sixteen point oh four grains of 100% uh, 24 karat gold is equal to $56. There's obviously been much more uh, debasement of the currency than that, but this gives you an idea of uh, at least today versus, versus uh, 1792. Now, uh, in 1792, as part of this act, the, uh, the price of gold to silver was about 15x. 
So it took it took 15 times as much silver, to, uh, as many as much silver to buy. Uh, so let's call it. Let's say it took 15 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. Now the 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 original function of uh, silver was for smaller denominations. It was much easier to divide. It was worth less, and um, that's one reason it was it was very popular. Now this kind of system is called uh, uh, bimetallic or bimetallism. Uh, just bi meaning two, and uh, metallism meaning uh, metal meaning meaning uh, metal. It might just have one T. I'm sorry if I if I misspelled that. Uh, but the basic idea was to use gold for the larger denominations, as we saw, and then silver for the smaller uh, denominations. And the ratio, the uh, the gold silver ratio was uh, was really 15 uh, 15 to one at that point. Now, by the middle of the 19th century, people had discovered that, or in the U.S. had discovered that it's obviously, it's fairly uncomfortable to carry gold around. You can lose it. It's very heavy in your pocket. It's difficult to divide. It can be stolen, uh, et cetera. And so what people would do is they would deposit the gold in a bank or some other vault. And then there would be gold certificates, which are essentially pieces of paper that were issued against that. And the gold was either held by a bank or by the federal government or state government. And what this meant is you didn't really need silver anymore because you could carry these gold certificates around. They could be infinitely divisible. Even if you had $100 worth of gold, you could uh, issue gold certificates that were a tenth of that or a fifth of that or one twentieth of that. And so it was much easier to carry gold, um, carry gold around and use it as a, a standard for money uh, and not really need these small silver coins. Now, combined with that, there were, in the middle of the 19th century, there were a bunch of silver mines that began to come online, began to open up, and the supply of silver really began to increase. Now, what's the problem with this? If you have a, a metal that's very common, like silver, and you can mine a lot of it, what you can do is you can mine a lot of it and use it to buy up gold. And what this does is it ultimately undermines the gold standard. The extreme example would be, let's say you could exchange shells for gold, well, you just go get as many shells as you can. Pretty soon you own all the gold in the world. And obviously this doesn't, this doesn't work. I guess it was called the Comstock load that was opened up. Uh, and so people by 1869, uh, they're worried about large quantities of silver coming on the market and endangering the gold standard. And so by 1873, uh, the U.S. moved away from bimetallism. Yeah, it looks like there's just one, one T. I misspelled it there. And so at this point, the U.S. moved from being on a gold and silver standard to being strictly on a gold standard. A lot of people didn't like it. People holding silver didn't like it. It's often called the crime of the crime of '73. Uh, if these people only knew what would happen in 1971 when we left the gold standard completely, that was the real crime. But this was the point at which silver was no longer used for money in the United States. And it, was, it, it had been moving this way, as we saw with the issuance of gold certificates. But at this point, it really became official. And if you had a bunch of silver, that you could no longer sell it to the mint of the United States to make into money. Now, at the same time, a bunch of countries, certainly in the 19th century, uh, had already moved to just strictly a gold standard. Uh, so in 1871, uh, Germany, or Prussia, I guess at this point, uh, said that they wanted to collect their war reparations from the Franco-Prussian War in gold. And once they collected that gold, then they moved strictly to a gold standard. We can see the Japanese trying to move toward a gold standard at the same time. And uh, so yeah, go Germany was officially on the gold standard by by 1873. If we take a look at all these different countries when they moved to a gold standard, uh, some were obviously earlier. Uh, but by, you can, if you just scroll down here, you can see by the late 19, 19th century, so by basically 1850 to the 1880s, all the major countries had moved to a gold standard. Switzerland, 
Germany was really the big one. Uh, France had done it a couple, France did it a couple years later. England was already uh, on it. And, uh, and then obviously with the Coinage Act of 1873, the crime of 73, uh, the US was fully on the gold standard. So there's been this, this, there had already been this movement away from silver as a form of money, and it became a really official by the end of, uh, by the end of the 19th century. So at this point, just like we saw that shells were demonetized and iron was demonetized and copper was demonetized, at this point we could say that silver was no longer money. It was used in some, uh, some US coins. Certainly, uh, I remember collecting silver dollars and uh, I believe silver half dollars that had Kennedy on it, JFK on it as a kid, but as an actual standard where you could take your, you could take your certificate to the, uh, to the treasury and trade it in for a metal. The only metal you could trade it in for was gold. So back, back at the early, uh, uh, back at the, the uh, Mint and Coinage Act of 1792, the market price of gold at that point, as we said, was about 15 times that of silver. In other words, you needed 15 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. Now, what happens once we move to the gold standard? When we, once we move to the gold standard, if we look right now, the price of silver is about $15 per ounce. The price of gold is about 1657 right now, 1657 so if we look at the gold to silver ratio, whereas it used to be about 15 in the, uh, in the late, what did we say, the late 18th century, right now it's above 100, it's 108. And this just goes to show how much gold has outperformed silver over that time. Now, obviously gold and silver both have industrial uses, but silver has become much more of an industrial metal and it's no longer a good form of money. If you stored your wealth in gold versus silver over the last 100 years, or let's say the last uh, 250 years since the, uh, since the Gold Act of, uh, the Gold Act of 1792, or the, the Mint and Coinage Act, whoever stored their money in gold got a lot wealthier. People who stored their money in silver got a lot poorer. There's still a lot of silver bugs now, and I feel sorry for them because they don't understand these dynamics. Silver is interesting as an industrial metal, but as we saw, it's extremely, uh, it's extremely uh, mean reverting. So we get the Hunt Brothers, we get the 2012 spike, but it comes back down. Now it looks like maybe it's come back down to a slightly, slightly higher level. It's really hard to say, but I definitely would not be storing uh, my wealth in silver. Some, some of this may, this new higher plateau may have something to do with the iPhone and certain electronic, uh, electronic uses of of the metal in uh, in computers and in uh, in uh, smartphones so there may be a, a higher plateau but if we compare that if we compare this price of silver to the price of gold we can see it's completely different so this is gold uh, expressed in US dollars uh, per troy ounce and we can see before the US left the gold standard officially uh, under the Nixon shock in 1971 gold was basically $35 an ounce they had to, uh, they basically printed so many dollars, they were no longer backed by gold, so we had to leave the gold standard. And since then, gold has uh, just gone up and up and up. We had a spike, uh, the famous spike in the late 70s, early 80s, and then we had kind of a long sideways market. But you can see that if you store, stored your wealth in gold, you did very well. If you stored your wealth in silver, you're still not back to uh, those 1980, uh, 1980 levels. And this is why it's very important to understand scarcity. Silver is not as scarce as gold. It's much easier uh, to mine. Now recently, gold has been rallying not just in US dollar terms, but also in, uh, in, in it's been rallying in all currencies. So if we look at, this is a chart of gold uh, expressed, gold price expressed in British pounds. It's really rallied even more. You can see it's much stronger in uh, in British pounds, as the pound is uh, as the pound is devalued, obviously the euro has a much shorter history, but as well uh, gold is rallying as well at all time new highs in terms of uh, in terms of euros as well. This only goes back to the foundation of the euro in in, in late '99. Interesting seeking alpha article here. 
uh, that points out the ratio of silver to gold in the Earth's crust is about 17 and a half to one. And this is very close to, if we look at um, what this, the gold to silver ratio, the silver to gold ratio was in the United States, as we said, 12 to one, 15 to one, something like this. It's fairly close to the ratio uh, of gold to silver in the Earth's crust, but gold is much more difficult, much more expensive to mine. And as a result, it's much scarcer and it functions as a better store of value. So if in revolutionary times we're at 15, 15 to one on the gold-silver ratio, uh, we can see now that we are uh, at something like, what did we say, 100 and, uh, I think the other on the other chart we said 108. This chart shows that we're close to 113, something, something like that. So we've gone from 15 to one or 12 to one all the way up here. Uh, some futures traders like to trade this as a mean reverting um, a mean reverting chart. You can see that there has been a point in history where you could, you could, for example, at this when you got up to the top of the range here, you would go short gold, and um, you would go long silver, and then when you got to the bottom here, you would go long gold and short silver. That's I don't think it's a very good trade. I think that as um, silver is never going to become money again. It's just too common. There's really no need for it. Uh, because we have, we now have paper money, we have uh, uh, banknotes, and you don't need to carry small silver coins for small denominations. I think once, once you leave behind something as a currency, you you just never go back. We're never going back to iron coins or copper coins or shell money as well. So I don't I don't like this gold silver ratio as a trade. Um, perhaps it, it, it makes sense to go long the gold silver ratio and bet that this will continue. But why, why bother? Why not, just, uh, why not just go long gold? Now, what is the reason for this? Why did gold eventually win the race for money? Well, the reason is because it has a much higher stock to flow ratio. Now, stock is defined as just the existing inventories. So the stock of gold would be all the gold that's ever mined in the history of mankind. Almost all of it's still around. It's mostly in central banks, central bank vaults like the Federal Reserve, Fort Knox right now. So it's not, it's not the best place where you'd like to store your money, have a uh, have a government holding it. But basically, all the gold is still around. It's around people's necks in in India, various parts of the world. It's in jewelry. Um, so that's the stock. That's the inventory of gold. Flow is just the annual production of new gold from from gold mines. And so we look at a ratio, we take the, the existing inventories above ground, we take the flow, which is basically how much new gold gets added to these inventories every year, and we divide one into the other, and we come up with what's called the stock to flow. You can see right here, SF for stock to flow. Now we can see it listed here for gold, silver, palladium, and platinum. We can see that gold has the highest stock to flow. It's got a stock to flow of 62. And one way to think of this is as in years. So at current mining rates, rates of production, it would take you 62 years to replace all the gold that's currently above ground, 62 years. It would take you 22 years to replace all the silver, obviously uh, has a lower stock to flow and hence has a lower market value. So the market value when this chart was made of gold was about 8 trillion, uh, of all the silver was about 308 uh, billion. These numbers have obviously moved up recently. Uh, and then you have things like palladium, platinum. I would add crude oil here. Crude oil is not a good store of value, as we've seen. It's very easy to pump. It probably has a stock to flow of about one, uh, depending on what point in time you're at. But you can see palladium, platinum, I would say copper is down here too. Stock to flow of just one or even less. Platinum appears to have a stock to flow of yes, less than a year, four tenths of a year. So you could replace all the platinum that's currently in the world in less than half a year's worth of mining. So it turns out that metals that have high stock to flow end up being used as money. They're monetary metals. Metals that have low stock to flow, like iron, copper, palladium, platinum, even though palladium and platinum are very rare, they're obviously much rarer than copper, they have low stock to flows, and so they're not good stores of value. And we can see this makes sense. This is one reason that uh, this is one reason that the gold silver ratio has continued to go up simply because gold is a better store of value. It's more scarce. When gold prices go up, 
as they did with, uh, with silver or with copper, it's just too difficult for the miners using current technologies to uh, create a lot more supply and crash the price. It's very expensive to mine gold. A lot of it's very deep in the earth. Now this could change going forward if Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos manages to uh, lasso an asteroid or a meteor, bring it back to earth. There's a lot of gold in the solar system and in the universe, but there's just not a lot on earth. And uh, the, the gold that is there is very expensive to mine. And so as a result, when the gold price goes up, as it is right now in all these different currencies, uh, it's very difficult to create a whole bunch more gold and crash the price. Now, these, this comes from a Plan B uh, article on Bitcoin that values, uh, that values Bitcoin using the stock to flow model. And he compares it to various precious metals here, various monetary metals, and contrasts it with various industrial metals like uh, palladium, platinum, and copper. In his most recent paper, he's got slightly different numbers. He's got the stock to flow of silver being a little bit higher at 33. It's, it's fairly difficult to find the right, um, the right inventory numbers for silver, I guess. So maybe silver has a slightly higher stock to flow than we previously believed, uh, but it's still nowhere near gold. Silver at 33, gold at uh, 58. So it's somewhere, here it says gold is at 62. It's somewhere around there, high 50s, uh, low 60s. Now, where is gold right now? Well, as of the writing of this paper, it's, it's since rallied, but gold had a stock to flow of about 58. And the market value of all the gold above ground was about 10 trillion. I think it's moved up to about 12 trillion now with the rally in gold. But what happens if, uh, so the argument he makes basically is silver is pretty scarce. Gold's a lot more scarce and Bitcoin is even more scarce. It's 21 million coins. And so what happens if Bitcoin ends up having a stock to flow that's close to gold? Well, if Bitcoin gets a stock to flow uh, that's close to, uh, close to 58, that would imply a market value of about 10 trillion. You could use 10, 12 trillion, I'll use the lower number. If you have Bitcoin at a $10 trillion market cap, in other words, it's market cap, the value of all the coins times the, the current price, if it's close to gold at 10 trillion, each Bitcoin will be valued at $476,000. For contrast, right now, uh, Bitcoin is about $9,500 per Bitcoin. So this obviously implies huge upside, which is one reason the stock to flow is so interesting. So what I would suggest is that as we move on in time, there's a good chance that Bitcoin takes over from gold in the same way that gold took over from silver. And why is that? Well, because Bitcoin will eventually have a higher stock to flow than gold. So let's say gold right now is about 58. Um, right now, Bitcoin has a stock to flow of 26. Bear with me here. Uh, it has a stock to flow of 26, but we're going into the halving on May 11th or May 12th, just in a few days. And its stock to flow is essentially going to double because the annual production of Bitcoins could be cut in half. Uh, so the the the, uh, the stock to flow in just a couple days of Bitcoin is going to be 53, roughly. Contrast that to gold, which is at 58. So this implies much higher uh, prices for for Bitcoin, and this is one of the reasons I'm so bullish on Bitcoin, because it's it's getting more and more scarce as measured by stock to flow. Now, what happens after? So you basically have a halving in Bitcoin every four years. We have one in 2020, we have one in 2024. So after the one that's happening in a couple days, the, uh, the stock to flow Bitcoin will be 53. In 2024, there's gonna be another halving. Bitcoins can become even more scarce. There's gonna be much less new Bitcoin added to it uh, every year. It's gonna get cut in half again. So the stock to flow Bitcoin is gonna go from 53 to above 100, call it 106. And this is how we start coming up with numbers like a million dollars per Bitcoin. Bitcoin is obviously much easier to store than gold. It's easier to transport. It's easier to hide. Uh, it's, it's quite subdividable. You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can, uh, it's divisible. Each Bitcoin's divisible into 100 million Satoshis, a little bit like dollars and cents. You have Bitcoin and Satoshis. And there's a good chance that eventually one Satoshi will be equal to one dollar uh, as this uh, stock to flow 
uh, continues um, continues to rise. This is a uh, chart that I'll link to that shows basically how well the stock to flow model has tracked the price of Bitcoin over time. So now from 20 from 2020 to 2024, this model has us at about a hundred thousand dollars per Bitcoin using uh, the new stock to flow. Uh, Plan B's latest paper has it closer to 200, the high 200 thousands, 288 thousand, I believe it is. I'll, I'll link to that paper. And then after the 2024 halving, we go to above a million dollars per Bitcoin. After the 2028 halving, uh, above three million dollars per Bitcoin. So Bitcoin does have a similar chart to gold. I, I couldn't figure out how to make this a logarith logarithmic chart, so it's not quite as steep as it looks, um, as it really should be. If I go over here, Bitcoin's like four or five dollars a Bitcoin. So it's actually much steeper than you can see here. Uh, we've been sort of uh, sideways since late 2017, but what happens after the halving is we enter, uh, so the last halving was in 2016, and that's when we went from, uh, we went almost up to uh, 20,000 per Bitcoin. So we're currently entering, one reason I'm so interested in Bitcoin, it's beginning to behave really well. Uh, it's up more than 30% on the year while the stock market indices are down. We're, we're about to have the halving right now and we're all set for a new ramp up. That should take us, I believe, at least to $100,000 per uh, Bitcoin by uh, sometime in, in 2021. And so the 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 uh, sort of the evolution continues. The movement, the demonetization demonetization of silver. I'm not saying that gold is going to be demonetized, but Bitcoin is is definitely uh, a form of money for the modern age. This is what millennials and Gen Z uh, kids like, and um, there's not a whole lot of interest in gold among uh, among the younger 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 generations. And I think that uh, will continue to push for. The demonetiz you know, push towards the demonetization of gold and the monetization of uh, of Bitcoin. I'll link to a few of my other Bitcoins in the description notes below. There are lots of common objections. It's a scam. It's a Ponzi scheme. The government can ban it, etc. But there are a lot of misunderstandings about Bitcoin. So the answer to my video would be gold is better than silver, but Bitcoin is definitely better than gold. There are only 21 million Bitcoin in the universe and there's a lot of gold in the universe and people like Elon Musk have their way uh, that gold is going to be headed to the earth probably faster than people think. If you found this video helpful, I'd encourage you to check out my courses. I have a whole course on um, follow my crypto investments, which is mostly showing, um, uh, gives you uh, transparency into my Bitcoin account, one of my Bitcoin accounts. You can watch me buy Bitcoin and hear my latest thoughts on it as well as um, a bunch of other courses. There are 13 courses, including bear market trading strategies, learn to trade stocks like a pro, a couple uh, options courses as well as a futures course, um, even a real estate course, a uh, covered calls course. So if this is something that interests you, you can click in the description notes below, take you to this page, and you can uh, click on any of these boxes. It'll give you the list of lectures. It'll show you the curriculum. Uh, then you can just scroll down right to the bottom where it says get it now. Now it'll take you to the checkout page. Normally tuition is just $125 for 30 days access, but because we're in a pretty deep recession, a lot of people are hurting, I want to give you a special coupon code. If you just click right here where it says have a coupon code, type in YT, as in YouTube, 99. Click update. That'll take $26 off, so you can get access to all 13 courses, including the Bitcoin crypto course, for just $99 for 30 days access. There are no long-term contracts or anything like that. So you can cancel uh, at any time and uh, uh, not, be, not be charged again. You can watch all the courses if you want in the first 30 days. In addition, I'll be adding new courses. I'm working on a day trading course as well as um, a course on, on uh, quant trading and systems trading as well. So stay tuned for those. Hopefully you found, guys found this video helpful. Please hit the subscribe and like button if you did. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Hope you're all doing well and look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching.